Well, we're going to go on with Act 16, and we got to that point where Lydia, this slightly uh, strange, unusual lady, who might be a bit of a whore, but um, selling, she's a hawker, she's selling expensive purple and stuff like that. She gets baptized from her family and totally turns to the Lord. And then Paul cures a, a, a girl who's telling fortunes, and they get mad with him, put him in prison, say, oh, we Roman citizens, you're, you're not, blah, blah. And he gets beat up, put in prison, and the jailer gets converted in the earthquake. That's what we're going to talk about. So let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the Lord Jesus and for the power that there is in him and in your word and in your spirit to change people. And we want to be changed and we want to have our eyes opened and our hearts opened to a new way to be, a new way to think, a new way to live. And above all, to live like that forever and ever in the endless ages of eternity with you and with him and with each other in your kingdom. Please, Father, go with us. We pray, Father, in the Lord's name. Amen. Amen. So, just to pick up where we got up to, verse 14. A certain woman called Lydia, a seller of purple, uh, of the, or a hawker, if you like, of purple. And I said yesterday that selling purple is sort of associated possibly with prostitution. You think of the... The whore in Revelation, dressed in purple. She's from the city of Thyatira. She's uh, not from Philippi. She's one that worshipped God. Yeah, so she's kind of a proselyte. That is, she wants to be a Jewess, but she can't be because there's no synagogue there. And she overheard the preaching by Paul. And when she was baptized, uh, sorry, uh, whose heart the Lord opened to give heed to the things spoken by Paul, when she was baptized and her household, she urged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, that is, I know I don't quite look the part, but if you judge me a faithful woman, I know everyone else thinks I'm probably not, but if you judge me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. So she's owning her own household. So she's got some kind of property. I don't think she was necessarily wealthy, um, but she says, You come and stay with me. So she persuaded us. And then there's this thing about where Paul cures this mentally ill girl who's a fortune teller. And 19, when her master saw the hope of their gain was gone, they laid hold of Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. He brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, are disturbing our city and advocate customs which is not lawful for us to receive or to observe, being Romans. The crowd rose up together against them, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. When they'd laid many stripes upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in shackles. Well, later on, after there's the earthquake, and everyone's, everyone's bonds are released, and the jailer gets baptised, Paul says to them, you know what, guys? He says, I'm a Roman citizen. It wasn't lawful for you to beat me without giving me a trial first. And that was indeed the case. But you think, well, Paul, why did you leave it till then? Why didn't you say at this point, when they're about to whip him and, and lash him, say, excuse me, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do that until you've given me a trial. You can only punish me after I've had a trial. Why, why didn't he go through with this? Well, it's an interesting question, but I think maybe because the other guy who was with Silas was not a Roman citizen, and so maybe he wanted to show identity with him, and maybe he wanted to use this somehow in order to get the Christians, these brand new Christians, in a favorable position with the Roman authorities. So the point is, he didn't have to go through this. He chose to go through it. He allowed it to happen to him. And there's a lot of things in life where it's not a case of black and white. Is this right or wrong? Should I do this or should I do that? There's a range of choices that you have. How generous should I be to this person in need? Should I give him 10p, 50p, 
five quid, 10 quid, 20 quid, whatever. There's no right or wrong answer, but the simple thing is if you love God, you want to serve him on the highest level. And that is what I think, that's, something of that is here with Paul. He says, okay, yeah, you beat me then. He doesn't say, I'm a Roman citizen, you can't do that. He only says that later. So, <clears throat> they uh, beat them really badly and threw them into the prison and told the jailer to guard them toughly, carefully. And having received this he order, he put them into the inner prison, that is, underground. This was called the underworld. That's what they used to call the inner prison. So there these guys are in the underworld, underneath their prison. No possible way to escape with their feet set in shackles, which literally means the wood which is the same word used actually about the cross. <coughs> so there they are, in the darkness, because later on the prison keepers calls for lights, because it's all pitch black. They're in the pitch black, underground, in chains. But about midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and their prisoners were listening to them. Now, coffee's over, dear. There it is. Um, so, instead of getting angry with God, bitter with God, why is this how it is? They were singing hymns to God at midnight, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They were praying and singing hymns. Well, hymns are prayers. Don't forget that. When you sing a hymn, you're actually praying to God. It's a form of prayer. Don't forget that. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. All the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And the jailer being roused out of sleep, he wasn't listening to Paul preaching, he wasn't listening to Paul singing, he was fast asleep. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Apparently, the ancient Greeks, we've got one of them with us here, we've got Spiros with us, but the ancient Greeks <laughs> had a saying that no God, you know they had loads of gods, loads of gods, but that no God can save you from an earthquake. That a God to save you from this, a God to save you from cancer, a God to save you from all sorts of different things, but they had a saying apparently that no God can save you from an earthquake. So there's the earthquake. And of course Paul and Silas are there underneath the prison, in the, in the underworld as they call it, in chains. Well, the prison keeper figures that if I don't, uh, if, I, if I lose my prisoners, I've got to die. So I might as well kill myself now, because they're all free. <coughs> but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, there's a few questions here. One of them is, well, why didn't the other prisoners all run away? I remember, as a really young person, almost a child, certainly a teenager, I had that question. I thought, well, why didn't the other prisoners run away? Great opportunity. Paul said, no, don't worry, prison keeper, don't kill yourself, you're all here, no one's run off. Why not? I don't, surely I don't run away. Well, I think that they all saw what had happened. But there they were in chains in the underworld and suddenly there is this earthquake and they're safe. They have been saved. They all thought this is God. This is God. And they all knew that Paul and Silas were in there because they'd been preaching Jesus. They knew this was Jesus and that they were saved. And I think that was so wonderful for them that they thought, I couldn't be bothered about anything else. Can't be bothered with getting freedom in this life. Can't be bothered running away and being a fugitive from justice. Can't be bothered. I'm saved. I'm saved. That's, to me, the only logical, psychologically credible explanation of why their prisoners didn't run away. And the prison keeper, when he sees this, Oh, wow, great, my prisoners haven't run away. Oh, I don't need to kill myself. He comes to Paul 
trembling with fear. What's he frightened of? He's not frightened of judgment by the Roman authorities because prisoners haven't run away. All good. Prisoners haven't run away. He's fine. So what's he frightened of? He's trembling. He falls down before Paul and Silas. He's fearful of God. He's fearful of God. He knows that he is a sinner and that he's encountered God. Simple as that, Jesus. Well, prison keepers, what sort of people were they? People who actually, their job is not only to just hold the keys of the prison, but to actually torture and abuse people. That was the idea of going to prison. What sort of people are they? Well, many years ago now, when we lived in Latvia, I, uh, I baptised a guy who had, in the Soviet years, had worked for the uh, communist authorities, and that was his job. He tortured people. They were concerned about Latvian or Lithuanians um, wanting to break away from the Soviet Union, and they had underground political movements. Well, his job was to, uh, he was a torturer. Well, at the time when I met him, he was an alcoholic, literally living in the, uh, literally sleeping in the gutter. Literally. He was an alcoholic. He was a smart sort of bloke, and um, he told me uh, his background, and he said, you know, the only way you could ever do the job that I did, I was a professional torturer, professional, the only possible way I could do that was to drink all the time, or drink in the evenings. Because my day job was torturing people. You know, cigarette lighters on men's testicles and things like that. Getting information out of people. This is a, so what you do in the evenings when you get, you get stone drunk. And you get up in the morning and do the same. And when you meet people like that, when I met him, I did think, Lord Jesus, could you change a guy like this? Isn't he too far gone? But he changed. And um, <coughs> baptised him in a bathtub, in a basement, and uh, he changed. It really, he didn't go from alcohol to, I don't know, drugs or something. He changed. And oddly enough, I married him um, because there's another lady who was coming to our church at that time. It was a Jewish lady. Um, go to the synagogue, I wanted to look into Christianity, and she was coming along, and um, well, they got together, I went over, well, I guess in the late 60s, 70, and they got married, and they had a number of very happy years together, I used to go around their flat, and um, yeah, talk about the old times and all that, and he, he fell asleep in Jesus, he died last, uh, last year, and uh, for definite, he's, uh, he's saved, no doubt, and so I saw that a torturer can be saved and can change. And this Philippian jailer was the same. That's his job. That was his day job. Can you imagine what a nasty-natured person he was? You know, I look around at us lot here. We're not saints, right? But we are all basically nice-natured people. I know you all. You're not, you're not you know, nasty. Yeah, weak. We're all weak. But we're not the, the sort of people who would get a kick out of torturing another human being. We wouldn't do that. Um, but once people start doing that and that becomes your job, it, it just twists their heads. I mean, I'm, I'm, it hasn't happened to me. I guess none of us can quite relate to it. But what I'm saying is here you've got the worst type of human being. You know? The very worst, whose mind is addled with all this hatred and doing what he does, he's getting stone drunk in the evening. That's the only, the only way the guy could cope with it. And yet, he now is <coughs> trembling with fear. Fear of God. Because he knows that he's encountered the preaching of Jesus Christ. And so he falls down before Paul and Silas, verse 30. Can we go and get the uh, case? Yeah, okay. Um, 
Trembling with fear, he falls down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, or Lord, what must I do to be saved? So you see that although, as far as we know, Paul had not specifically preached the gospel to this guy, there is an inbuilt conscience in every man and woman that knows that I am responsible to God. And we all know that. When you push that on people and say, you know what, sin is your big problem. People say, oh, don't give me all that God stuff. I don't believe in a God. I'm an atheist. There is no atheist. You know, as often said, there's no atheist on a plane that's about to crash, right? <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, sorry, God, please help me, God. You know? So it is. And uh, no, everybody's got that conscience. And all you have to do is just surrender. Surrender. Hands up, surrender that conscience to God. So, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, his family. And I bet his family weren't his greatest fan. Can you imagine if the man of the house is a professional torturer who's drunk in the evenings? I wonder what his family thought of him. Probably not very much. Probably not very much. It's different if you're, if the head of the family is, uh, I don't know, if he's unemployed or if he's a plumber or he's a house painter or he works at Tesco's or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dad or husband. Oh, yeah. He's a good man. But if, they, if the man of the house is a professional torturer whose job it is to torture people and he's stone drunk every evening, I guess the family would not be his greatest fan. So, <clears throat> Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. You see how God thinks widely. Not just you, but your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, to him, and saw that were in his household. It's as if these guys hadn't heard it before. And at that hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. At that hour of the night. This is in the middle of an earthquake. When there's an earthquake, there are always aftershocks. An earthquake doesn't just happen, and that's how well, the earthquake happened. Earthquakes go on for a while. There were tremors, aftershocks. So there would have been aftershocks. And the logical thing to do would be to say, well, you know, um, uh, yeah, okay, we'll talk about religion uh, when we've done the cleanup. We'll talk about religion a bit later. But just for now, uh, we've got to secure the prison, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. But no, that hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. And immediately, he and all his family were baptised. A baptism of a whole family in the middle of the night. And I see that all through... The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, which Luke also wrote, there's this idea of immediacy. People were baptized like immediately. And it says that the Lord added to the church daily people who should be saved. So they were baptizing people every day. They didn't say, I'll oh, come back on Sunday, or, oh yeah, we do baptisms uh, once a year in our church. Yeah, yeah, well, next time it comes around, we'll do you. No, no. There was an immediacy, there was an urgency. And there is an urgency in humans' position, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. It is as simple as that. And you see there's a kind of mutual relationship here that he washes them, he washes their wounds, the wounds that he has just done to them, right? Because it's, it was his job to torture them. He washes their wounds and they baptize him in water. That's uh, sort of very nice. And that is how it is in relationships in Christ, in a functional church. I mean, why bother with church? Well, why bother? Yeah, because when you do meet other people who are genuine Christian believers, there is this mutual relationship between you, which is called the unity of the Spirit. So, after that, verse 34, he brought them into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced greatly with all his family, having believed in God. So, uh, as I say, um, I, I guess him and his family weren't the greatest uh, of friends because of 
his day job, and he's uh, I'm certain he was drinking in the evening. Um, and I've heard that before. Other people have dealt with people who've done torture have said, oh, you know, they're all alcoholics, they're all druggies, they're all stoned in the evenings. Yeah, they, it would just make absolute sense. Um, so him and the family are united and rejoicing. And there's a parallel with what happened with Lydia. Her heart was opened, and then she was baptized and invited Paul into her house. It's the same here. The prison is opened. The prison keeper is baptized, and he invites Paul into his house. Well, <clears throat> that's how it is. Things go like that in power. All this is alluding to great prophecy in Isaiah that talks about the Lord Jesus, that he came to set the prisoners free, to open the prisons, and to release our shackles. So actually, Paul there in the underground prison, he was every man. This is all of us. In the darkness, tied down by the shackles of addiction, sin, repetitive sin in whatever form. That was all broken. You know, you talk about break every chain. Well, yes, this is what this is talking about. And so you come back to this sort of question, well, are some people so far gone that, you know, God can't get to them or that Jesus can't get to them? No. You keep meeting these kinds of people and you realize that yeah, everything is possible, spiritually, no matter how far you've gone. None of us here have gone anywhere near as far as this guy. You might say, oh, I'm a heroin addict. You might say you're a heroin addict. But you haven't gone as far as this guy. Oh, no. You're not torturing people all through the daytime and then doing your heroin at night and get up in the morning and, you know, cut a few people's limbs off the next day, get a confession out of them and then shoot up with heroin at night and up, up next day up do the same. Yeah, you're not doing that. And it's the same with the Apostle Paul. He tortured people. And, you know, it is so that often what we have done to other people ends up happening to us. He tortured people. He put them in prison. Now he is tortured and put in prison. It, it's not that God is sort of punishing him, but rather I suggest because God wants people to know, he wants us to know how other people felt at what we did to them. Because we're going to be together with some of those people forever. Paul is going to be together forever with those Christians whom he tortured and put in prison. And so the Lord wants him to understand, even in this life, what it felt like. And so that's why he goes through it. It's why we said the other day, Paul was stoned. As in stoned with stones, not on something else. He was stoned. Why was that? Because he had got Stephen stoned to death. So in all this, God is working so carefully with us. And although we don't sort of attach meaning to event, that is, you can't immediately understand why this is happening, why that didn't happen. It is also true that you can accept quite easily, I think, that nothing in my life is random. Even if I don't understand it, there is no chance. It's not random. That somehow God is working through absolutely everything. Right, so when it was day, verse 35, the magistrates sent their officers saying, let those men go. The jailer reported the words to Paul saying, the magistrates have said words to let you go, so come out and go in peace. And then Paul says, they've beaten us publicly, uncondemned men that are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. Now they want to throw us out secretly? No. Let them come out themselves and bring us out. Well, I suggested that that might have been because Paul wanted to get the Christian faith sort of established there with the authorities. Right, Paul, could you pass the code on the sir? Okay, um, It could have been that, or it could have been sort of cussedness. 
because I do perceive in Paul a, um, yeah, a, a rather difficult uh, streak in his character. Right, we've all got being difficult for the sake of being difficult. Uh, gorgeous. <laughs> don't worry about it, don't worry about it. We'll sort it out after you. Um, I, I do perceive a difficulty there in his character at times, very argumentative, very difficult, thank you. And uh, yeah, that may have been the simple reason, thank you. And I think that that is typical of all of us, that you can have great faith, great spirituality in one part of your life, but you've still got these weak bits in your life. And I'm not saying that's okay. I'm just saying that even Paul had that. We looked the other day at how Paul and Barnabas had a fallout and an argument, which you would see was largely Paul's fault. Um, okay, and it so wasn't resolved for possibly ever, but certainly for many years. It doesn't mean it's right to have fallouts and arguments in the church and all that, but these little bits of humanity are inserted into the record to remind us that even God's very best men were weak and very human, apart, of course, from the Lord Jesus. So, if you want to be baptised, come back to my place afterwards in South Croydon, got a bathtub, get baptised into Jesus. Don't tell me you don't know enough. What did the jailer know? He was told the gospel and his family, all those people who heard the gospel that hour of the night, believed it and were baptised. Sweet as. Just straight up. Simple as. And I'll, I'll drop you back to Croydon afterwards by four o'clock. How's that? Don't say no. Okay, so let's give thanks for the bread and the juice. And through this, we show our identity with the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread in which we see the body of the Lord and the cup in which we see his blood. Lord, please do come close to us and may we come close to you and identify with you and open, Father, our prisons. Release us from every chain that binds us and help us to run with joy and with freedom in your way to your kingdom. For the Lord's sake. Amen. Amen. Right, well, we got the food up there. Thank you, sis.